Hello everyone and uh, welcome to the International Studies Institute Contemporary Studies Lecture Series. My name is Eleni Pastera, I'm the director of the International Studies Institute and uh, I want to thank you all for coming for uh, this semester's uh, special lecture. Uh, the speaker, Dr. Ruben Arston, was born in Northern California in uh, Santa Rosa. He was educated at um, Antioch College, the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and uh, where he received his um, master's in um, literature. Uh, he also received his rabbinic ordination in 1982. Uh, he received his PhD in Arabic and Islamic studies from New York University. And uh, he's the Wegenstein Professor in Medieval Judaism and Islam at Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion in Los Angeles. He's also the founder and acting co-director of the Center for Muslim Jewish Engagement, a partnership with the Omar ibn Antaka Foundation, the Hebrew, Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion at the University of Southern California's Center for Religion and Civic Culture at the College of Letters, Arts and Sciences, a division he's had uh, since 2007. He has also served as the president of the International Quranic Studies Association, 2015 <coughs> as the vice president of the Association for Jewish Studies, 2011-13, uh, and he's a member of the Jewish Committee on the International Abrahamic Forum of the International Conference of Christians and Jews. Furthermore, he is on the International Advisory Board, Doha International Center for Interfaith Dialogue at Doha, Qatar, and he is um, on the International Interreligious Advisory Committee of the Center for Catholic Jewish Studies, St. Leo University in Tampa, Florida. Among his uh, recent publications, are the following books. Holy War in Judaism, The Fall and Rise of a Controversial Idea, uh, with Austin University Press, 2012. Who are the real chosen people? The meaning of chosenness in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. An Introduction to Islam for Jews, that came out in 2008. Trialogue, Jews, Christians, Muslims, and Dialogue, a practical handbook, which he co-authored with Leonard Swidler and Khalid Duran. Children of Abraham, an introduction to Judaism for Muslims, which came out in 2001 and was translated also in Turkish and Arabic. And um, Learned Ignorance, an investigation into humility in interreligious dialogue between Christians, Muslims, and Jews, a book he co-edited with James Heck and Omid Sashi, with Oxford University Press 2011. If you go to his um, curriculum vita on his academic website, there are then eight pages of articles, academic articles that he wrote. I'm um, skipping those. And um, in addition, he is a public intellectual, having um, published several essays in, in popular articles, op-ed pieces, and so on, which you can uh, read online. Some of the titles include, You are an Islamophobe. Another one, Not all Christians are terrorists. <coughs> Another one, no, Pamela Geller, the Quran is not anti-Semitic. Uh, Tahrir Square, a revolution in progress, and others. Uh, among his many awards, he was a Fulbright Scholar in um, Cairo, in Egypt, in 2006.
With the new year, we at the International Studies Institute at the University of New Mexico affirm once again our commitment to an open and educational dialogue about our world, our cultures, our peoples, our religions. We thank the university administrators, our colleagues and students for supporting our mission and for participating in our programs. And we also thank the broader Albuquerque, New Mexico community for coming to our events. Uh, particularly, we want to thank Vivian and George Cadre and the Jewish Community Foundation of New Mexico, whose support has made possible the Contemporary Jewish Studies Lecture Series. One of our earlier speakers, Dr. Martha Tether, discussed the intertwined histories and faiths of Judaism and the Catholic Church. Today's speaker, Rabbi Dr. Ruben Firestone, will speak on Muslims and Jews, a history of a relationship. We also invite you to join us today at 3 p.m. at the History Commons Room in the History Department, Mesa Vista Hall, for a colloquium with uh, Dr. Firestone. The title of that is Savagery and the Sacred, the Rhetoric of Terror and its Consequences in the Scriptural Monotheism. By learning more about the other, the other, or the others, we come away also having learned more about ourselves. Studying the other is a way of holding up a mirror that highlights also what we are about, that makes us rethink our own beliefs, our own prejudices, our own strengths, our own weaknesses, raising more questions about ourselves at the same time that allows us to learn more about the others. And that prepares the ground for a deep dialogue. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Firestone. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to be here today and thank you for showing up. Uh, when we were, I was talking about coming here and my wife and I decided we'd both come and she asked me if, um, if it was impossible to spell our name if we could get a city named after us too. So uh, it's nice to be here, and it's nice to see people here. Um, the, let me get down to business, because I know we don't have a lot of time. Uh, we have a class that is over at, uh, I think, I was told I only have uh, an, uh, two hours and 20 minutes, I think, this morning. <laughs> so uh, the, the possible term for this talk was Jewish-Muslim relations not a historical perspective only, but also, is there a non-politicized assessment? And that's kind of the... Can you move the mic up a little bit? So Thank you. Be happy to. Is that better? <laughs> How's this? Is this better? Okay, and I, I will uh, make an effort to speak into it. If, if, uh, if it's difficult to hear me, raise your hand. If you disagree with me, you can just, just walk out or yell. It's all okay. So I sometimes begin my talks by citing a, an Egyptian colleague of mine uh, who for many years ran the Middle East Studies Center at the University of Utah. His name is Professor Ibrahim Karawan, and he begins his first uh, class in Intro to Middle East Politics with the following statement. I'm paraphrasing it. I understand that many of you take this course because you want to understand better what is happening in the Middle East. Many of your student colleagues have told me that you take the course because you believe I can help simplify things for you so you can understand what's really going on there. But you must know that if you really want to understand, I must complexify things for you. That's a wise statement. Life is not simple. Like much else in the world, the history of Jewish-Muslim relations is also complex, neither reflective simply of wonderful harmony, as some simplifiers would claim, 
nor simply a violence and persecution, as other simplifiers would claim. In the next few minutes, I will offer an overview of the more complex reality of Jewish-Muslim relations in history. From the perspective of Islam, Jewish-Muslim relations began even before the birth of Muhammad and the emergence of a religious movement that came to be known as Islam. The Quran itself refers to Abraham as a Muslim. Uh, and I'm just going to take this moment to show off and re recite a little bit from the Quran. Uh, this is Surah 2, chapter 2, verse 127. وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُ إِبْرَاهِيمَ الْقَوَائِدْ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ وَإِسْمَعِيلِ رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا إِنَّا أَنَّكَ أَسْسَمِعَ الْعَلِيمِ رَبَّنَا وَجْعَلْنَا مُسْلِمِينَ لَكَ وَمِنْ دُورِيَّتِهِمْ وَذُورِيَّتِنَا أُمَّةً مُسْلِمَةً لَكَ When Abraham and Ishmael were raising up the foundations of the house, which is understood by 100% of Muslim commentators as a reference to the Kaaba in Mecca, he said, O Lord, accept this from us, for you are the hearer, the knower. Our Lord, make us Muslimain to you, and our progeny a Muslim people to you. So according to the Quran, while ancient Jews were indeed Jews, or Hebrews, or Israelites, one of the terms, a common term in the Quran, is Banu Israel, like the Hebrew Bnei Israel, children of Israel. When they were responding, these people who are Israelites or Jews, when they were responding properly to the divine will, they were actually Muslims. They were submitting to God's will. They were being obedient to the divine command. This is the definition of the word Islam. A Muslim is someone who submits to the will of God. So the Israelites, all of the prophets in the, Quran, in the uh, Hebrew Bible and the New Testament are small m Muslims. Doesn't mean that they went to the mosque on Friday, that they prayed five times a day, that they observed Ramadan, but they were Muslims in the sense that they were obedient and submissive to the will of God. Also from the perspective of Judaism, a level of Jewish-Muslim relations began in essence long before the emergence of the Quran, with the birth of Ishmael, who represents for the sages of the Talmud, the progenitor of the Muslim peoples, from whom uh, uh, came uh, eventually um, Muhammad. That is, Ishmael was the progenitor of the Arab lines in the Hebrew Bible from Genesis 25. You can see, if you are a linguist and a geograph geographer of the ancient world, that the children that derive from Ishmael are, uh, represent Arab Arabian tribes. But these are prehistorical references that are based on sacred scripture and its interpretation rather than the writings of human historical witnesses. So they reflect history through their role as interpretive statements, but they're not really history themselves. My task today is to give you a sense of actual Jewish-Muslim relations in real history. And I'm going to do this by centering my remarks on the question of the so-called golden age of Jewish-Muslim relations. This age or period is said to have occurred in the Middle Ages, primarily in Muslim Spain, but also to a certain extent also in places like Baghdad or Cairo and other centers as well. There are two very different perspectives on this golden age these days, two polarized views of the relations between Muslims and Jews during the Middle Ages. One perspective has it that everybody was happy during the golden age. The Muslims treated the Jews as brethren with equal rights, honored them, gave them full status in Muslim society, and provided a political and social environment in which Jews could thrive. Under such extraordinary conditions, Jews produced their greatest works of science and literature, religious law, philosophy, and theology. And Baghdad, Saadia Gaon, developed the first formal Jewish book of theology, influenced, I should add, by Islamic collections of theology. He also produced a poetic dictionary and translated the entire Hebrew Bible into classical Arabic. In Fostat, Cairo, Moses Maimonides wrote an encyclopedic code of Jewish law, the Mishneh Torah, 
and the most important Jewish philosophical work in history, The Guide for the Perplexed. Dozens of other Jewish intellectuals and scientists developed new insights in linguistics, optical science, astronomy, geography, literature, poetry, and Bible scholarship in Spain, in North Africa, in Yemen, in the land of Israel, and much of the Middle East. Jewish grand viziers ran the administrations of Muslim sultans, and the Andalusian rabbi Shmuel Hanagid, also known as Ismail ibn Nahrila, even functioned as the head general for the Muslim king of Granada, Badis, for 16 years. Jews and also Christians were encouraged to be fully engaged in a great and open civilization made up of Muslims, Christians, and Jews. They were encouraged to engage in debate with Muslims and Christians in the majalis, the intellectual courts that caliphs and sultans and wealthy patrons organized to encourage debate as a form of intellectual entertainment. As amazing as all this appears, all of these grand developments are documented. They really happened and they all occurred under Muslim rule. In contrast to this rosy picture, the other perspective cites harassment and violence, discrimination, oppressive taxation, public humiliation and ridicule, pogroms and forced conversion. It was forbidden by law in the Muslim world for Jews to build new synagogues or to enlarge standing synagogues or even to make repairs on them. Jews were forced to wear distinguishing clothing and even yellow badges. They were forbidden from riding noble animals like horses. They were forcibly converted en masse in Spain, in North Africa, and Yemen. It has been documented that children were removed from their Jewish families and raised as Muslims. And Jewish quarters were pillaged, men were massacred, and women raped in Morocco, Algeria, Yemen, and Iran. Every one of these negative portrayals is documented by Jewish, Christian, or Muslim sources. There is no doubt among recent historians that they occurred. So what was it? Was there a golden age or was there not a golden age? Uh, the answer is, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> I won't answer the question yet, but I think you may be able to answer it soon. Keep in mind what I said a few moments ago, that life is complicated. If we want to truly understand, we need to be willing to consider the true complexity of history. We can return to the question shortly, but first I'm going to tell you another story. Muslim rule on the margins of Europe was repulsed in the Middle Ages by Christian crusades and armies. Spain, which had been a Muslim land for centuries, was taken over by Christians. At the beginning of Christian rule in Spain, Jews were welcomed and treated extremely well. But eventually, all Jews and Muslims were forcibly expelled. Hundreds of thousands were forced to give up virtually everything and forced into exile. The Jews were kicked out in 1492, and the Muslims 10 years later. You may not know this, but just as there were crypto-Jews, conversos, anusim, there were also crypto-Muslims, part of a larger community of converted Muslims called moriscos. And as many of you know, some Jews found their way here in New Mexico to escape the Inquisition that followed them to Spain. When the Jews were forced out of Spain in 1492, they were welcomed into the, span in the expanding and self-confident Ottoman Empire, a great empire ruled by a Turkish Muslim sultan. But many Jews, for a variety of reasons, either chose or had no choice but to flee to other places. Many suffered during this time of terrible dislocation. Some Jews who found safe locations under the Ottomans wrote to their brethren to inform them of the good news of a better life there. One famous letter is often cited in this regard, the letter of Rabbi Yitzhak Sarfati, and I'm going to read it to you. I've heard of the afflictions more bitter than death that have befallen our brethren in Germany, of the tyrannical laws, the compulsory baptisms, and the banishments, which are of daily occurrence. I'm told that when they flee from one place, a yet harder fate befalls them in another. On all sides, I learn of anguish of soul and torment of body, 
of daily exactions levied by merciless oppressors. The clergy and the monks, false priests that they are, rise up against the unhappy people of God. For this reason they have made a law that every Jew found upon a Christian ship bound for the east shall be flung into the sea. Alas, how evil are Jews, the people of God in Germany, treated. How sad is their strength departed. They are driven hither and thither, and they are pursued even unto death. Brothers and teachers, friends and acquaintances, I, Yitzhak Sarfati, though I spring from French stock, yet I was born in Germany and sat there at the feet of my esteemed teachers. I proclaim to you that Turkey is a land wherein nothing is lacking, and where, if you will, all shall be well with you. The way to the Holy Land lies open to you through Turkey. Is it not better for you to live under Muslims than under Christians? Here every man dwells at peace under his own vine and fig tree. Here you are allowed to wear the most precious garments. In Christendom, on the contrary, you dare not even venture to clothe your children in red or in blue, according to our taste, without exposing them to the insult, or beaten black and blue, or kicked green and red. And therefore are you condemned to go about meanly clad in sad colored raiment. And now, seeing on these things, O Israel, why are you sleeping? Wake up and leave this accursed land forever. This letter is real. It documents a certain sentiment at the time that was prevalent during the period of Christian persecution of Jews in Muslim Spain. This may sound odd to us today, but from the perspective of medieval Jewry, Christianity is an evil, violent, merciless, and bloody religion. And Jews wrote about how they suffered. Christians not only persecuted and killed Jews and Muslims in local massacres and crusades, they also persecuted and killed other Christians whom they defined as heretics. In the Muslim world, while Jews of course did not accept Islam as an adequate expression of monotheism, they were far more favorable toward it and toward Muslims than toward Christianity and Christians. Jews wrote that Islam was a civilized religion, while Christianity was not. Even if by Jewish standards, Muslims were misled into believing things that according to Jewish belief were untrue. So when we consider these stereotypes, I'm sure some of you may be thinking exactly what I thought when I first ran across these. It's largely a reversal of the common Jewish perspective regarding Christianity and Islam today. In the 12th century, some 80% or more of the world's Jews lived in the Muslim world. Only 10 to 20% lived in the Christian world. By the 19th century, the numbers were reversed. The reversal reflected the dramatic change in the economic and intellectual developments in Europe and the economic and intellectual decline of the Muslim world. 19th century Europe had experienced the Reformation and Enlightenment for its Christian inhabitants and the partial emancipation of its Jews. There were no Muslims to speak of living in Europe at the time outside the borders of the Ottoman Empire, which extended into Europe. Remember that at one time the Ottoman Empire included what are today the European countries of Greece, Bulgaria, former Yugoslavia, Moldavia, Romania, Crimea, much of Hungary and parts of Ukraine. In the 19th century, many Jews were emancipated in Western Europe, in places like France and England and Germany. But the overwhelming majority of world Jewry lived in Eastern Europe, where they were still deeply hated, and many suffered from persecution and pogroms. Jewish intellectuals in Eastern Europe were impatient with the lack of Jewish emancipation. They complained about it, and they wrote about it, citing actual letters like the one I just read to you in order to push European Christians to rectify the situation. Their message to the European Christians went something like this. If you are truly enlightened and you really believe in the ideas of the modern European social philosophers, you must not consider only Christians to be human. You must also accept us Jews. So here was their message to their Christian European overlords. We Jews lived in a golden age under the Muslims. Those very people whom you currently dominate intellectually and politically and economically. How can you, who claim to be enlightened Europeans, 
abide being outdone in moral stature by the now weak and underdeveloped Ottoman Empire, which is barely surviving while Europe is developing so quickly and with such confidence. This was the position of some Jewish intellectuals who wanted to embarrass their Christian rulers into granting them full and equal rights. Other Jewish intellectuals used the story of a golden age under Ottoman Muslim enlightenment to encourage Jews to leave Europe, and especially Eastern Europe, to settle in Ottoman Palestine under the new Zionist movement. Under the Muslims, they said, the Jews lived without problems. And Sarfati's letter, among others, is proof. So come and build up the Jewish homeland. The Muslims will not impede us. They will only welcome us. To a certain extent, this encouragement worked. The Jewish community of Palestine expanded greatly from European Jewish immigration, first under the Ottomans and then under the British mandate after World War I. The more that the Jewish community grew and developed, the more land it settled and the more active it became in local, meaning Arab, social, economic, and political affairs, the more threatening it became to the local non-Jewish population. And you know the story there. As the tensions grew, so did the violence. Each side genuinely felt that it was in the right, and so did, and so, and its opponent was in the wrong. Each had its own narrative as to who had the right to live and become dominant in the land. Each community needed support from outside of Palestine in order to push its own agenda. The Palestinian Arabs looked toward their Arab brethren, both Muslim and Christian, while the Palestinian Jews looked toward the West for support. Each side accused the other of unacceptable behaviors, and each tried to gain the support of its own hinterland of potential supporters. Lots of writings were used for this. We would probably call these writings propaganda today, or I guess if it were today today, we might call them alternative facts. <laughs> because both sides cited true facts and figures and then interpreted and even distorted them to push their own agendas. By the middle of the 20th century, the rhetoric had turned quite harsh. Some Jews accused the Arabs of being violent and primitive in their violent opposition to Zionist immigration, or even anti-Semitic. The Arabs were opposing the wonderful development that Jewish settlement in Palestine was bringing to everybody. How could they possibly be against it? Some Arab intellectuals, in response, took the highly publicized story of good relations between Jews and Muslims in the Middle Ages to counter such accusations. After all, they claimed, the Jews themselves wrote that Jews and Muslims lived together in peace under Muslim rule while Jews were being relentlessly persecuted by Christians. They argued that modern Arab rage toward Jews and Palestine was not anti-Semitic at all. It was not about Jews. Rather, it was directed only against those Jews engaged in illegal and immoral colonization. It was not the Arabs, but the Jews who were destroying the old harmony through Zionism and its claim for Jewish settlement, which meant uprooting and delig delegitimizing the natural Muslim Arab right to Palestine. In other words, according to their argument, there is no inherent Arab or Muslim antipathy toward Jews and Judaism. We Arabs are enlightened and ethical, they said. We enabled the Jewish golden age. It's the Jews who have caused the problems. And Arab antipathy toward Jews would end when Zionism abandons its colonial quest. Thus, the true story of relatively good relations under Muslim rule in the Middle Ages was transformed into the myth of the perfect golden age. This myth was then countered by Jewish intellectuals through a Jewish counter myth to challenge the Arab propaganda. Jews developed their own highly charged narrative, especially after 1967, when some Jewish writers played down the good aspects of life under Muslim rule and cited only the ins ins instances of prejudice and violence, massacres and expulsions. And there were plenty enough to cite. This Jewish anti-Golden Age rhetoric began among journalists and popular writers, but was soon taken up also by historians and other scholars. And it also distorts the trend by citing real facts, but in the other direction. This Jewish position reflects the frustration of Israelis in their continuous wars with Arabs and what they considered to be unreasonable Arab intransience and hatred. 
It also reflects the shock of discovering the new, truly anti-Semitic rhetoric coming out of the Arab Muslim world in the last decades. Now I'm going to add one more piece to the mix to show you how complex the situation really is. Both Muslims and Jews have their deeply ingrained prejudices about themselves and about others. This is a natural aspect of human identity and behavior. Virtually all human communities define themselves as better, more civilized, or even more human than others. I sometimes lecture about this, and when I do, I usually cite texts from religious traditions that paint the other in very negative terms. The Bible and the Talmud have a lot of bad things to say about Arabs, as well as other non-Israelite peoples. And those Arabian peoples are understood as proto-Muslims in later Jewish literatures. The Quran and the Hadith have a lot of bad things to say about Jews, as well as other non-Muslim groups. And guess what? Christian civilization has a lot of bad things to say about both Jews and Muslims. So there's plenty of nasty rhetoric to make everybody feel bad. Much of it is just there. It's what I call latent negativity, anti-other feelings, which die, lie deep in all cultures and societies. And it's probably a part of human nature. Much of the time, it's just there, latent but not actualized into hatred and violence. But when there is tension or conflict, the latency can be made manifest. It's often picked up or rediscovered and then publicized as truth. See, some would say, look at the bad behavior of Arabs found in the Bible or of Jews found in the Quran. No wonder we have troubles today. They were always like that and they always will be like that. Today, with the deep tensions that have grown up around the Middle East because of the Israel-Palestine conflict and terrorist attacks by Muslims on Western targets and Western invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan and more terrorist attacks and the tension that has accompanied the large recent Muslim immigration to the West and especially Europe and the latest prejudice on both sides which becomes activated and disseminated in op-ed pieces, in newspapers, in books and magazines, on radio talk shows and TV, on the internet, and now in political campaigns and even government policy. Nasty anti-Semitic material readily available in Arabic and Farsi, Urdu, and other languages spoken and read by Muslims, and nasty Islamophobic material readily available in English and European languages spoken and read by Jews and Christians. All of these current tensions deeply affect our views of Jewish-Muslim relations. So how golden was the golden age? The real story of Jewish-Muslim relations has always been affected by historical context. And now after complexifying the topic a little bit, I'm going to give you my opinion, which you probably already picked up from my remarks. The position of Jews in the Muslim world was better overall than in the Christian world for a number of reasons that I don't have time to go into at this moment because they're going to take us away from the thrust of the argument, but we can deal with them during Q&A. In fact, overall, the position of Jews under Islam was the best that was available in the pre-modern world, at least in the monotheist pre-modern world. But the position of Jews under Muslim rule was not what we would wish for today. In the modern world, the position of Jews has been far better such as in the United States today. And it has been far worse, such as in Germany and most of Europe in the 1930s and 40s, and in the Soviet Union under communist authoritarianism. The truth of the matter is that Jews and Muslims have always had a lot in common in terms of religion and culture and spirit and civilization. It would benefit both communities to learn more about one another and work toward pooling our resources and experiences so we can build a better world for ourselves and for the larger communities in which we live. Thank you. So uh, what do we do now? I, uh, yeah, so, okay, so I, I'm very happy to field the questions. If you have a question, raise your hand. I'm gonna give you a number. 
<laughs> One, two, three, four. That's it. Okay, remember your numbers, please. Number one. So, um, in your, your opinion that uh, Muslims and Jews to come together to create for the better of all communities, where does Christians lie within that? Uh, did you hear the question? The, the uh, question was, um, you ended by saying Jews and Muslims should come together for the better of their own communities and humanity. Where do Christians fit into this picture? That's a good question. The, uh, sometimes, let me, how do I say this in a way that's going to be uh, clear? Uh, dialogue doesn't mean just verbal discussions. Dialogue means engagement between people. And uh, we all need to dialogue with one another, engage at various levels, in talking and engaging in mutual projects, Sometimes Jews and Muslims and Christians need to all talk together. Sometimes Jews and Muslims and Christians and Hindus and Sikhs need to all talk together. Sometimes three is a crowd. Sometimes you need to have bilateral engagement. In some ways, Jews and, Christ, uh, Jews and Muslims in this country have some aspects that are very important that they have in common. One is they're non-Christians living in a Christian country. Now, many Christians would argue, we don't live in a Christian country. But if you're not a Christian, you know you live in a Christian country. <laughs> so there are ways in which Jews and Muslims need to engage together in order to further their own individual, righteous, and legitimate agendas as being non-Christians living in a Christian country. And, right? But then there are some aspects in which Muslims and Christians need to talk together, and Jews don't need to be in the room. And that's also advantageous. And vice, you know, it goes in all these different directions. So the, the topic this evening or this afternoon, this morning, <laughs> is um, Jewish-Muslim relations. So that was what I concentrated on. But that's not the end of the story. OK? In the golden age in Spain and other countries, the Jews and the Muslims got along, but the Muslims were in charge. And uh, whenever. It's never been where the Jews were in charge, except in Israel today, where there are Muslims living in a Jewish society. Uh, and uh, my perception is that the Muslims in Israel were treated, are tr being treated better than the Jews were being treated under the Muslims in the Golden Age. Because the Muslims were in charge, they lived in the synagogues, and there were expulsions of Jews from Spain in the 12th century, 13th century, and in the 14th and 15th centuries. Uh, did you all hear that? Pretty, pretty well. Thank you for saying that loudly so people could hear. Uh, yeah, so the, uh, we're talking about a complicated situation. There's always, you always have to be careful about comparing uh, apples and oranges. Are we comparing apples and apples, or are we comparing, uh, comparing apples and oranges? And there's never a clear answer to the question, because there's always some kind of overlap. And there, there are important commonalities, and there are important differences. In the pre-modern period, before the French social philosophers of the 17th, 16th, 17th century started looking at and considering the possibility that maybe all humans are equal, in the medieval period, it was understood and known that the people who are in power privilege their brothers and sisters. That's just the way it worked. How do you define brothers and sisters? Certainly in terms of kinship, in terms of language, in terms of religion. Everybody accepted that. That was normative. It was normal for Jews, because they weren't in power, not to have the same status as people who were in power. The Jews knew that. The Muslims knew that. The Christians knew that. The Berbers knew that in relation to the Arabs. These are all these kinds of negotiations. We still see this occurring in many other parts of the world, and we could say in the West as well, at a different level. So that was, in the pre-modern world, it was to be understood. If, now, and now I'm going to get really controversial, and I'm not going to give you an opinion about this. I'm going to give you a perspective. From the, from the there are Arabs in Israel, or Muslims in Israel, and the terminology, or Palestinians living in the state of Israel, who would argue 
that their treatment under Israel is far better than the treatment of Jews in much of the Muslim world. There would be other Palestinians who would say the opposite, who would say, no, we, we, we may have equal rights on the books, but our, the, the state of Israel does not give us adequate budget for, for sanitation, for, for uh, bus transportation. Um, I lived in an Arab village uh, in the Wadi Ara area in which there were no street signs there, and there were no uh, numbers on any of the homes that were there. They were, it was like a suburban town. And, uh, and the, so that the EMS people could never come in and find the right place on time. And the reason wasn't to prevent the EMS from coming in, but according to the narrative that I heard from the people I was living with, was because you couldn't then vote by individual um, uh, voters, by address as we do in the states, but you had to vote through kind of tribal blocks. And uh, the political parties in Israel were, were manipulating the tribal blocks to try to get them to vote for them. So it gets very complicated. How do these things work out? Um, yeah, in the modern period, it should, be, it should be expected that minority populations in a true democracy should be given equal rights. And we all know that in true democracies, minority communities may have equal rights in law on the books but don't necessarily have equal rights in the way that these laws are enforced or allowed, you know, or behaviors between peoples. So it's a very good point, and I hope I've complexified it adequately. Thank you. Number three. Uh, as a legal study student, I'm sorry, as a? As a legal study student, uh, and mostly in speaking out of trade relations, uh, is the uh, philosophy, religion, science, and magic. Okay. As a medieval study student, I'm mostly interested in relations, interfaith relations in relation to philosophy, music, uh, magic, magic uh, religion. religion. Okay, yeah. And? Uh, to what extent do you think that the relations between Jews and Muslims can be uh, further contextualized by studying those kind of uh, intellectual subjects or other uh, Western subjects like Sufism or Kabbalah? To what extent can Jewish-Muslim relations be contextualized or understood by studying these particular topics? Uh, it's, a, I, it's a great question, and uh, the answer is it's being studied a lot currently today. One of the areas of, uh, of great interest is the influence of Sufism on Jewish uh, mystical developments. Particularly, uh, there have been work on kind of Kabbalah coming out of this kind of world, but. There's a third party in there because Kabbalah really came out of Christian Spain, not Muslim Spain, and, or southern France even. Uh, but they were also influenced by Sufi ideas as well as ideas in the church because there's a lot of mysticism in the church as well. So uh, issues of science, shared science, shared philosophy, Maimonides and Ibn Rushd uh, were this, from the same generation, from the same town, probably from the same neighborhood, got exiled by the same bad guys. Uh, and uh, they probably didn't know each other. But they ended up writing uh, profoundly influential works that were in many ways quite parallel in terms of their Aristotelian approach to cosmology and all. So yeah, uh, um, that can make us all feel good, and, and it is true that communities are constantly, this is a political term now, borrowing, because <laughs> when you borrow something, it's not yours. But that's really, not, that's really not the case. There is no pure inspiration. No artist, no musician, no writer is inspired by the, what do you call them, the Greek, uh, the me, m muses. Nobody's inspired by the muses. Everybody is inspired in context of influence. There is no inspiration without influence. So yes, Jews learned a lot in the medieval period and the direction went mostly from the Muslim sciences to the Jewish world in that case. In, the, in an earlier period, it went the other direction. We can learn a lot from one another this way, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that social relations were, were, were great, right? Thank you. Uh, in the Americas, in North America, in the Southwest, in Northern New Mexico. And it's something that I've been saying 
had for years, frankly. And whenever this is broached, what I hear is things like, okay, well, you look at the architecture, you see this, uh, to some extent, names, like a student I had in the uh, Royal Sacred Heart Tower series named Medina, uh, but uh, her names like Layla. Uh, but again, very, very little research. So um, the question is, what is, what direction or how would you go about researching this um, crypto-Islamic um, presence uh, and continuation in the Southwest? Uh, and just two thoughts related to that. One could be confounding variables, like if a family says, we don't eat pork, well, they could be either Jewish or Islamic background, because that's the reason. Um, and uh, what other thing I was going to ask? Uh, oh, yes, and then also because the families oftentimes that knew they were of Jewish background tended to intermarry, at least up until recently, uh, just wondering if perhaps the families who knew they were of uh, had Jewish roots and the families who knew they had Islamic roots had more interaction among each other, between each other than each of them did with those who were overtly Christian without this um, knowledge. Yeah. Great, really interesting uh, suggestion and uh, agenda, which I, is a good desideratum. I, uh, I don't really know a lot about this. This is not my area. I, I would presume that if, um, Mus if Morisco Muslims were escaping uh, the uh, Inquisition in Spain, they wouldn't go to the Americas. They would more likely go to a Muslim country because that was available to them. And then, they, and then they had to deal with the problem of their identity. The, both Jews and Muslims have the problem if you are if you are a, a convert out to Christianity, then will you be accepted back again? Or are you gonna get yourself into trouble? Will you be welcomed by your community back? Because there were so many people who refused to be converted and either died for it or ran away. And then there's a lot of resentment. This is kind of social resentment. Uh, and th these are other issues that I don't wanna get into right now, but that, that was, was an issue. But ne nevertheless, it would be much more logical or reasonable for a, a crypto Muslim who is being outed or is in fear of being outed or couldn't stand it anymore and wants to get back into things uh, to find refuge in a, in a country that was governed by a Muslim ruler because then they could be free. Jews didn't have that opportunity and that's probably why so many Jews came to New Spain and then when the Inquisition came to New Spain they wanted to come to the outskirts, to the periphery, to escape the Inquisition, and that's why there was this movement toward New Mexico. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's understandable. Very interesting, how do you go about doing that? As far as I understand, and this, I'm an outsider on this, but just from my few discussions with people recently, I understand that there's a, a certain amount of sensitivity among Catholics who have or may have Jewish background some people might embrace that. Some people might not embrace that. And there's a lot of baggage there on this issue of latency, remember? So that, that's, a, that's a tough question, even within the Jewish community. And then thinking about the Muslim community or the, or the crypto or, or perhaps crypto Muslim community, that also I think is difficult. And um, given, I'm just, I'm just imagining, given the it's certainly the history of the Jewish community of crypto Jews. I, I would suggest that they probably wouldn't be too open to intermarriage with uh, uh, someone who might be potentially a crypto Muslim as well as they would with a, with a Catholic. They'd be, be seeking a crypto Jew, but even that you don't even, might not even know how you are defined as a crypto Jew, right? Because that's so complicated. Anyway. Talk about complexifying, yeah, thank you. Certainly is a, a great area, I think, to pursue. And I'm not sure if there would be a payoff, but it doesn't mean it shouldn't be pursued. And not just the material culture, which is science, but the non -material. Absolutely, right, yeah, thank you. And I think we're at, not the la was there one more question? Yes, okay. Yeah, I, just, I just had an addition to what you were saying, as you were saying, and you brought up a point about how Muslims would be more, or crypto Jew, Muslims in, 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 
uh, of Andalusia would have pre preferred to go to a Muslim country. But let's not forget, under the pressure and under the, uh, the Crusades at that time, and what the politics were in the country, and the fact that Muslims were the ones that manned the ships, they had the technology, they had the know-how. So most likely there were many Muslims that came on the ships, maybe forced by, 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 the, by the Spaniards. The knowledge was with the Muslims. So somebody had to man the ships, I do believe. Actually, I am from the Southwest, and I kind of I feel that there was that kind of mix. And the, the fact that Muslims, Christians, and Jews lived so wonderfully for 800 years, I actually think they were probably much more comfortable in intermarrying because they were more accepting of, of one another. That's a good theory, actually. It's something to think about. Something to pursue. Yes. So we need more, uh, uh, somebody needs a master's thesis idea, <laughs> do some, uh, and, uh, yeah, do some uh, uh, ethnographies. That'd be great. Agreed. <laughs> the, the, the question was, from the gentleman was, do you think uh, that's a perception that there is more Jewish-Muslim dialogue in the U.S. than, say, in other countries? And do you mean specifically Europe, or do you mean like in South Asia? There, there are very few Jews in South Asia, but in other I, I think specifically in the U.S. In, okay. U.S. Is, is compared to what? The rest of the world. The rest of the world. Right. Right. Well, the only, the only places in which there can be Jewish dialogue with Muslims in the world today are the U.S., Europe, uh, East, including Eastern Europe. There are a few Jews, not many. Russia, in which there are a fair number of Jews and a lot of Muslims, 14 million Muslims in Russia. And, and then a few Jews in Tunisia, a few Jews in Morocco, not very many. Uh, the answer is, um, yeah, I, I think so in the U.S. It's, there is more of a relaxed relationship than there is in Europe in general. But there's a lot going on in Europe. There's a lot of dialoguing going on between the Jews and Muslims and between Muslims and Christians. I, I'm more engaged with, uh, know more about what's going on in Germany and in Britain and less so in France and in Holland and in Belgium, because there, in all these places there are programs and there are attempts. But um, yeah, there's, there's more tension in Europe in general, because this, the situation of the Muslim community in Europe is more tense than it is in the United States. You might think it's bad here. It's not good here, but it's better, I would suggest. But there are Muslims in the audience, too, who could comment on this from an American perspective and uh, from your expect. Uh, family and friends and travels in other parts. I don't know. Do you have any comments about that, people? About, about Muslim status in the U.S. versus, say, in France, Britain, Germany, to what extent Muslims are engaged in uh, dialogue with Jews and Christians in this country as opposed to other countries? Yes. What do you envision as relationship when all these groups have, at, at their fundamental uh, belief level, really, really different beliefs? When they would relate and express these beliefs in the hope of being understood, um, does it not often provoke outrage and, uh, you know, 
the, what we see now, the divisiveness. So what, what would be relationship? Is it, is it uh, secular civility, political, legal, um, or what are we looking for? Um, what are we looking for by relationship? Right, that, so that's a good, great question. I mean, how, there are, there are irreconcilable differences in terms of theology and practice between the three major monotheistic traditions. I always get a kick out of this. Jews get to be one of the three major monotheistic traditions when, I mean, in terms of demography, I mean, <laughs> there, there, there's no way that they should be in that, uh, you know, in that triumvirate. But, um, but, but in terms of history, yes. Uh, the, the one, one response is to say, well, let's not deal with the religion aspect. Let's have a kind of secular society, a democratic secular society in which there is no uh, uh, um, privileging of any religion in a state. And then we can relate to one another as people, and we don't have to relate to one another as being either in or out of our religious communities. That has been, to a certain extent, effective, I think, in the US, uh, but hasn't really resolved a lot of the issues. There are many people who are in uh, the world of theology in the, among Jews, Christians, and Muslims in the US who are trying to work out ways to engage theologically with another and to, and this is one of the projects that I think was mentioned that, with that book on uh, humility and dialogue. What is it? I forgot what the name of the book was. Something like that. Uh, something about <laughs> intellectual humility or something like that. Uh, the bottom line, some people say, people who like study religion as a phenomenon, arrive at an interesting conclusion. There's a problem. There is a, a deep theological problem with the notion of monotheism. And that problem, the simple problem is, it's, it's almost so simple it's profound. If there is one God, and that God is all-knowing, all-caring, all-powerful, why would that God give different revelations to different people? And with those revelations, they differ with one another. They, they, they contradict one another in, in a number of ways. They seem to privilege one community. Each revelation seems to privilege one community. I mean, there's a lot of interpretive adjustment that you can use in terms of the kind of hermeneutics of how you understand that scripture. But the bottom line is, one God gives three different scriptures. Now, did God forget? The first time, that's impossible because God's omniscient. Was God sort of deciding to play with us, you know, and, you know? No, because God is all good and loving. So, so what's that all about? And interestingly enough, it's, it's possible to say that all monotheists actually agree about this in a way that you wouldn't believe. We all agree that um, only one of them can be right. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, if that's the case, then the very existence of another, of another scripture, another authority, because remember, scripture is the word of God. This is the most authoritative artifact we have of religion. There's nothing more than that, because it's God's word. So, if someone is claiming that mine is the truth, and if they're, right, and then therefore, it's, is it a zero-sum game? If yours is true, then is mine false? And, and it's, it's not a simple problem to, to resolve. But there are people now who are beginning to engage in what I would call a greater deal of humility. Yes, there may indeed be one absolute truth out there. In fact, there probably is. But do I have it? Do you have it? Who has it? Can anyone have the hubris and arrogance to say that they understand the word of God and they understand God's design. That's ridiculous. So if we would be a little bit more humble in our relationships and understand that, and, and, and feel good about our tradition and, say, and, and, and feel adequate, be able to say, I think mine is better, but it may not be absolutely true. And that you have a deep truth in yours and I can maybe learn something from you. That, I think, is something from within the religious communities that we need to work on. Yeah. Okay, so one, two, and three. Yes.
Yeah, yeah, he recently you know, died. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think we, I think we have been, uh, we've been on the quest to find the commonality that brings us all together. I think we also need to, um, we need to celebrate the differences. That's something that we've been afraid to do. And it's fine to have differences. And uh, we can, you know, I mean, we're all, I mean, I also see, this whole endeavor is a kind of related, we're all, we're all one big tribe, even just within the monotheistic traditions. We're all one big tribe. We all believe in one God. We don't always conceive of God in the same way. But we're all one tribe. But within that tribe, we have different clans. We have the Christian clan, we have the Muslim clan, we have the Jewish clan. And within those clans, we have these different family units that are different communities within. Shia, Sunni, Sufi perspectives, Presbyterians, uh, Presbyterians <laughs> Evangelicals, Catholics, Orthodox, and in the Jewish world too. Jews, of course, always agree about everything together. So, <laughs> so but, but that, in a way, we're all part of the same, we're, in a way, we're all part of the same religion. Um, but we have differences. Of course, we can define those differences as heresies, you know, as evil. Or we can define those differences as part of the reality of the human experience, which is based so much on differences within commonality. So, yeah. Thank you. Hello. Comments, thoughts? Yes. Oh, sorry. Did... Can you address any questions about the Quran? I, I can, as a non-Muslim, address uh, some questions about the Quran because I do study it. Supposedly it says in there that they'll either kill, maim, maim destroy the, in the word it skipped my mind right now. And how well is that belief held by, and maybe I should address this to the ladies over there, how well is that belief uh, can't put the words. How well is that belief held by the common Muslims that we see walking around the United States? Right. So anybody who tells you that 90% of Muslims. Uh, oh, uh, oh, okay, let me. I'll try to. You correct me if I say it wrong, okay? I, as I understood, the question was uh, can you comment about aspects of the Quran that seem very violent, that go out and kill and maim and whatever, right? And he didn't say whom, right? right, right. Uh, and uh, to what extent uh, do Muslims respond positively to those or, you know, are, are into those particular uh, expressions of violence? All right, and, and I'm going to answer the question as a, as a historian of religion by not dealing with the Quran directly until the end. 
because I want to contextualize the discussion. So there is, in my experience, and this is an area that I work on, I, I wrote, I, I just have to say it, I wrote a book on jihad and Islam before 9-11. <laughs> so it wasn't politicized. It was a question. Why, where does the notion of, and, I, and it wasn't jihad. The book was about divinely authorized war. The publisher, Oxford, wanted it jihad because they wanted to be able to sell the book. So it became jihad. Because, because anyway, there's a whole discussion on what is the meaning of jihad and why, you know. And so, of the three monotheistic traditions, all these traditions have what we call vectors or trajectories of thought about everything. There's great universalist expressions and, that are really concerned for the welfare of all humanity. And then there are very internal particularist expressions that are really look like they only care for the community of believers and don't really give a damn about anybody else outside the community. And those kinds of statements look like they're in tension with one another. They do appear to be in tension with one another, but that might be purposeful, right? Because life is complicated. So uh, that also has to do with violence and reconciliation. In all of our uh, scriptural traditions, and I do a lot of work on this, there are uh, texts that extol violence. I don't know if they would always extol violence, but they certainly permit uh, violence, and some of the violence is very graphic in divinely authorized terms. And they also include uh, a plenty of material that call for reconciliation and nonviolent means, problem solving, dealing with nonviolent means. So these are, look like they're in tension with one another. Now, Historically, people relate to scripture uh, based on their contextual world in which they live. Like, uh, I just, I give you, I give one example. For those of you who are going to come to the talk this afternoon, I'm going to actually deal with this in some detail. If you are, if you are happy and you feel good about yourself, you know your children have a future and you, you know, there's food on the table, you feel good. You want to reach out to people. You want to be loving. You resonate with those beautiful, loving verses of our scriptures that want to reach out to people. But if you are feeling hurt, unfair, unfairly demeaned, uh, you don't get a fair shake. You are brutalized. Your children don't have a future. You don't have enough food to eat. You see other people who are privileged and you are not. You're going to relate to the aspects of your scripture that are calling for vengeance, and we all have them. So what does scripture say, and how is it read? Right. Scripture is a compendium, a sea, we say. It's a sea, an ocean of, um, of emotions, of thought, of ideas, of notions, of traditions. And, and we interpret it the way we do. So Judaism was a, an extremely militant tradition in the biblical period. Uh, Jews were the first to forcibly convert communities that we know to monotheism, long before Christianity even existed. Under John Hyrcanus, the Hasmonean king, converted the Edomeans to, to Judaism and forcibly brought them in. Uh, and, and Jews were apprised mercenaries. They manned this great uh, uh, border post in Elephantine in Egypt. We found a temple there in, in Aramaic manuscripts all about Jews and Jude Jews that were living in Elephantine. It was, a, it was a military garrison of Jews that was under the Persians, the pre-Islamic Persians. Uh, and that's really interesting. Uh, and then uh, Judaism made a big turnaround and became an, an, a, a quietist, nonviolent tradition. And I argue that the reason they did that is because violence stopped working for them. Violence works great. They, the Jews celebrate, we celebrate the, the festival of Hanukkah every year, which is a military conquest of the Greeks. Pretty tough people, right? We beat those damn Greeks. <laughs> and we celebrate it every year. And that's because God helped the Jews beat those evil, pagan, horrific, Hellenized, <laughs> nasty foreigners. <laughs> European colonialists. And then, uh, and then the Romans came. Well, we did it to the Greeks, we can do it to the Romans. But it didn't work. <laughs> and the result was horrific. The destruction of the temple, the end of Jewish sovereignty, 
the deaths of hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of Jews through violence and through dislocation and starvation. And <coughs> Judaism then didn't, we didn't throw away the, the verses that extolled violence in the Hebrew Bible, but Jews re-examined them, reinterpreted them, and found a way to get rid of them. It is, in, at least for all intents and purposes, in terms of policy because it was too self-destructive. So I argue that religions will use violence when it's effective and when it helps the community of believers. This is an observation, not a theology. It's an observation, a historical social science observation. But when violence is self-destructive, it is bad for the community, religions will end it as best they can. Here's the exact opposite situation. The Christianity emerged into history under the Roman Empire, which had a monopoly on violence. Anyone who engaged in violence outside the authority of the Roman Empire was destroyed. There were messianic figures that we know of from like Josephus, this uh, historian, and they were militant messiahs. They were all put down very quickly by the Roman Empire. Jesus was not a militant in that sense. And, and if I argue that if the New Testament uh, extolled militarism as did the Hebrew Bible or the Quran, because they lived in areas where they could be effective, it would have been wiped out as a movement right away. It never would have survived. So the New Testament is arguably less prone to militancy and violence than the Hebrew Bible or the Quran. But if you look carefully, there's a lot of rage, a lot of anger. Jesus says, I have not come to bring peace to the world. I've come to bring the sword. There are all kinds of references that are, that are really angry and rageful. But it couldn't be activated because it would have destroyed the community. But the moment the Roman Empire became Christianized, what happened to all those verses about love? The Roman legions became a tool of the church. And the church used them and became arguably the most militant religious community in human history. It wasn't so much, the Byzantines were bad enough, but it became even more militant under the Crusades. Oh, the Roman Empire? Well, the Crusades were even greater. In, in the Byzantine period, you, you, the armies, the Christian armies of the Byzantine Empire could go out and fight and destroy the pagans and the infidels, but if you killed someone, you still sinned, and you had to do atonement. In the Crusader period, if you killed someone, you were already atoned, you already had atonement from just going off into battle. So you basically, you were given carte blanche. That was like the ac absolute pinnacle of, so, and that, but now we don't have that today in the Christian church, why not? I argue because it became not only not effective anymore, but it was self-destructive. What happened when the Catholic and Protestant armies were devastating between five and a half and 11 million people were killed in Europe in the Thirty Years' War. Mm -hmm. 35 to 40 percent of the population of what is today Germany was wiped out. Hundreds and thousands of villages and towns were completely decimated. And they were doing it in the name of religion. I mean, there were a lot of other political factors. Of course, there are always political factors behind the religious rhetoric. But it was really, and so guess what happened? The church and the Protestants began to retool again and to move away from militancy because it was too self-destructive. So it's not so simple. Yeah. So just because there may be violent rhetoric in the Quran or in the Hebrew Bible doesn't mean that people believe it or, activate or act on it or they believe it because if it's a scriptural text, it's a divine text. But th what does it mean? What is its meaning? And how are we supposed to respond to that? The, the most... The most violent verse in the Quran, which is called the sword verse, par excellence, and it is said to abrogate lots and lots of other verses in the Quran, says, al mushrikeen haythu wajad tumuhum. Kill the idolaters wherever you find them. Lie in wait for them, ambush them, kill them, destroy them. The next verse, the next verse that follows it says, but if they seek uh, refuge with you. Give them refuge and teach them and lead them to their place of safety. That's the next following verse. So 
what do you, what do, you do with that? I think, and this is my purely non-religious, cruel, academic perspective, is that the editors of the Quran, when they were putting the Quran together, put some of these verses that look like they're in tremendous tension with one another right together because they wanted people to be disturbed by them and to think about them. And what, is, what does God really want? The problem is that a lot of times you, you only get the citation of one side right. and not the other. And, it, and, and not only some militant Muslims will only cite that one verse, but a lot of militant Christians will cite the same verse and say, look at those Muslims, they're all horrible. Right. You know, and life is complicated. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Sorry? You can find it. That's right. And then we call that cherry picking. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. Probably. Yes. Question. Or do they just continue to function, you know, hope here and jihad and whatever here? Um, because I don't think they're the same populations that are involved in these worlds. Uh, I, I, I think there's a deep intellectual wall, and, uh, and we don't pass the limits. Right. So, right. well. Uh, Well, one of the, one of the uh, advantages of this world is that in the university forum, uh, you get students. And sometimes they show up. <laughs> and, and they can be influenced. And they can have a true education where they learn that life is complicated mm -hmm. instead of overly simplified. And those students then get out there and they become leaders in industry and maybe they go into politics and they become involved in the community at large. And we want many students. We want them to, to learn these things. We want them to, to be able to be sophisticated in their thinking. That's part of our job in the university. And not only in the university, it should be our job also in the high schools in, as well. But, but it doesn't, it's, not a, it's not a rarefied world in which there's no contact. There are, uh, here's a community who's come to hear somebody who came from uh, you know, somewhere else. If I was local, I probably wouldn't be invited, but if you're somewhere else, there's this famous statement, ain't navi but yiro in, in the Bible. There's no prophet in his own village, right? <laughs> you have to go somewhere else. Um, but, you know, and, and, and then it's our job to activate and to act on our, what we learn and what we think and to engage in dialogue with people. And that's for, for Jews and Christians to reach out to Muslims who are beleaguered in this country and to really engage. Just, just be friends. Engage in projects together. Uh, have a relationship with your vendors or the people that you work with in your communities. And then engage in mutual projects together. The, the bottom line is, and, and here I'm saying this as if I know what I'm talking about, <laughs> the bottom line is in a, in a culture, in a society, is who controls the discourse? Who controls the narrative? Whose vision, whose opinion, whose facts are the facts? And, and there's always contention over that. There always has been and there always will be. So what, when, I, when I was a, uh, a young idealistic guy and I, I lived on a kibbutz in Israel 
and I lived there for a few years, and it was a very, what they called a tired kibbutz. A kibbutz is a communal settlement where all, everybody pools their resources, and they work together. And this was founded by Polish immigrants in the 1930s who thought they were socialists. And then they came, and they suffered a lot, and they created a, an agricultural settlement, and then they just got really tired, and they just didn't, didn't want to have anything to do with anybody anymore. And I was this gung-ho you know, guy. And we wanted to do cultural programs, and nobody was involved. And I, and I, I complained to the, the secretary general of the settlement and said, uh, uh, by the way, within the green line, everybody, and, <laughs> I, and I said, I, I can't, what's wrong with you people? And he said, there's nothing wrong with us people. He said, look, we on this kibbutz are a microcosm of the world. This was so brilliant. He said, we're just like everybody else. 80% of the people on this kibbutz is just a blob of people, a kind of mass, that don't have a whole lot to contribute, that don't have, not negative, they're just there. And there are some real complainers and real problematic people who are poisoning that group in the middle. And they're pulling them to the negative. And they're always going to be negative. And they're always going to be downers. And that's just the way it is. So if you want us to even stay neutral, you've got to be active and you have to stop, uh, never stop being active. Because the moment you stop, that blob in the middle is going to go toward the negative equation. And if you get enough people in the positive, you're going to move into the positive equation. But it's a forever issue. It's a forever quest. And you should never give up that quest. And that was a long time ago. That was real wisdom. And he was just a farmer. Yeah. So. Thank you.